Hello everyone again, final reminder, kindly keep your uh, videos and your microphones muted unless you are um, presenting your idea, your team is presenting the idea. Um, so please uh, make sure that you all turn on your videos on microphones only if you are presenting uh, or your team has been called to present the idea. Please make sure that you are uh, um, joining audio using the internet so you can speak using Zoom. Um, if anyone knows someone from the team who still haven't joined, uh, so please ask them to join now. Um, when you are called to present, you will have five minutes to present only, and then you will have 10 minutes to answer the judges' questions. Keep your answers short and on point. Thank you all and wish you all the best of luck. Can I ask everyone to turn their cameras on now, but keep their microphones muted? Can you please turn on your camera, everyone? Good to see you all. Okay, please everyone turn on your cameras, keep your microphones muted. As soon as the judges start with the judging process, or as soon as we start the, the presentations and the judging phase, please um, turn your uh, cameras off and only the team who is presenting will have their cameras on.
Can everyone hear me now? Everyone? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. For those who said that yes. they can't hear anything, can you please make sure to join using audio? Maybe try and exit the meeting and enter again because we will be going live in less than five minutes. It's, it's your video we couldn't see. It's our video. We couldn't activate the camera because the host had not allowed it. Okay. Um, this is the same for members of Trinidad and Tobago. Is there someone who's still facing issues and turning on their cameras? Yes, I'm having problems. Linda from Canada. Okay, one second, Linda. Can you do that now? Do that now. Good to see you, Linda. Anyone else having trouble turning on their cameras? Mr. Puji of UAE. And and Geraldine Cox of UAE. Do that now. Good to see Please try turning on your cameras now. And kindly, everyone else, keep your microphones muted. Geraldine Cox of UAE. And, and Geraldine Cox of UAE.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our distinguished guests joining from all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the Virtual Idea Fund participants and our respected judges. Welcome to the Virtual Idea Fund, Building Resilience Within Communities, an idea-based hackathon within the framework of U the UAE Volunteer Campaign. In the following two hours, each participating team will present the ideas that they have, they have been developing and working on during the idea fund for their actionable solutions in response to the challenge that was revealed on Monday 9th, November 2020. The challenge was, how can we ensure that those in our community who are vulnerable can be supported, reassured, cared for, and monitored during a crisis situation when the regular channels of care are unavailable or curtailed. Let us take this opportunity to thank the judging committee members who will, who will support us with their expertise to fairly and reasonably assess the team's efforts and processes based on international judging criteria, enabling them to evaluate the team's submitted ideas. Allow me to introduce our judges for this sub-theme volunteerism to support the vulnerable. Mr. Aziz Al-Amiri, advisor at Ministry of Community Development. Mr. Abdullah Shahi, chief operating officer at Dubai Cares. Ms. Boram Kim, plan of action coordinator, volunteering for the 2030 agenda at United Nations Volunteers. Ms. Bianca Fadel, doctoral researcher at Northumbria University, and Ms. Maytha Mohammed Al Mansouri, Director of Communication and Marketing Department at Zayed Higher Organization for People of Determination. Mr. Mohsin Gull, Research Consultant, Youth at Ayave. Best of luck for the participating teams, and we will now begin by introducing the teams. Each team will have five minutes to pitch their ideas followed by a 10 minute question and answer sessions as mentioned before. The teams are the Manila Water Foundation from Philippines, Forget Me Not Alzheimer's from United Arab Emirates, Bumi from India, De La Salle College of Saint Ben Laid from Philippines, Rwanda Volunteer Network from Rwanda, Traso from Colombia, the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago from Trinidad and Tobago, and Better Living Health and Community Services from Canada. Welcome everyone. Again, I would like to remind everyone to keep their video and their microphone turned off unless you are presenting. So if you are presenting, turn your cameras on and your microphones. And now, we will start by calling the first team, which is Manila Water Foundation from Philippines. You have now five minutes to present. Go ahead. Thank you. Without reading the headlines, the photos that you see may look beautiful and inviting, right? The one on the left. You are looking at a very polluted lake, the Laguna Lake, one of the largest in the Philippines. The, that fisherman on the photo belongs to one of the communities around the lake, such as Barangay Santa Ana in Rizal province. Obviously, with the infestation of these invasive plant species, the water hyacinth, his source of livelihood is affected. The very exciting idea is that there is a glimmer of hope because of the water hyacinth proliferation. From this sullen situation is a vibrant opportunity for volunteers, organizations, government agencies, and local government units to come together through the provision of an alternative livelihood program, which we call Liliab. Can we therefore build and implement a successful business model that vulnerable communities can adopt as a livelihood opportunity? This water hyacinth can be converted into a biochar, which can be marketed as a consumer 
or an industrial product, and our projections tell us that this potential livelihood program can be a source of a $30,000 gross revenue for the community. With this extra resource, we can help assure that this marginalized peri-urban community can have the proper mechanisms to be resilient. With proper training and additional source of income, they can be well equipped for the future. What are we going to do? So with a potential funding, we can actually do a pilot facility to test the viability of the business model, which we can scale up for other communities in the country. We will be able to use existing technologies developed by local engineers and inventors who can also be tapped as volunteers for the technology transfer. This will be a multi-sectoral partnership with the academe, government agencies, and the active participation of community volunteers. Now, Manila Water Foundation envisions this social innovation to be very successful and one day be managed by the community members themselves that one day Manila Water Foundation would just be visiting the vibrant and earning livelihoods in that community that we have supported through our partnerships. Across activities from the pre-demonstration phase, test and learn, the demo proper to scaling, Manila Water Foundation will be closely monitoring and hand-holding the community through their own community volunteers. Input from scientific studies and technological improvement and volunteers from outside the community to work hand in hand. Project Liliab aims to see positive change from the community partner, their immediate environment, and the strength of community cooperation and volunteer effort. Manila Water Foundation will be looking into increased household income for the community, see established new streams of livelihood, and a healthier, robust coastal environment where marine life thrives. And across all of these, various activities will be facilitated and powered by volunteers. Capacity building, mentoring, and feedback sessions will be held so that the hands working within the community link with the hands working from outside to uplift communities from disadvantage, hand in hand, led towards prosperity. And so, why is Project Liliab the winning proposal? Our team at Manila Water Foundation believes we have a strong chance with Project Liliab because first, the project safeguards communities of more than 12,000 households against economic disadvantage by offering not just alternative means of livelihood, but encouraging the mindset of having multi-streams of income. Second, the project celebrates the Filipino ingenuity combined with science and technology in providing a solution to an ecological imbalance. Plus, it encourages smart and strategic business thinking among communities so as not to be dependent on aid. Finally, the project believes in and provides the avenue for the burning desire of Filipinos to help others in the spirit of bayanihan and malasakit or compassion. From waste to value, Project Liliab ignites the innate passion to extend a helping hand and shape positive change through the power of volunteerism. Thank you. That was amazing. Uh, we will start now uh, the 10 minutes judging. Judges, for your questions, you may go ahead. But first, we will go with uh, the, the first judge, Mr. Aziz Al Amiri. You may go ahead and ask them their question. Yeah, thank you, Team Manila. That was amazing. And the question I have, I might have missed that, but where is the sustainability idea that can keep this uh, project in the future? Hopefully, it will get the, uh, the chance to win. Where will we find the sustainability uh, thing on it? Thank you. We will be backed up uh, by many organizations who will contribute to the success of this uh, community project. We will be involving the national government agencies, NGOs, and of course, at the heart of this program, the community members themselves. Um, they will be um, organized and there will be more recruited volunteers from within the community to ensure that there will be the, um, the workforce for the production of the biochar 
And then this will be supported by the network of um, uh, co um, organizations from outside helping um, the marketing aspect, the production, uh, the scaling and commercialization of the products that they will produce from the waste um, that is um, uh, prevalent in their community. And uh, we will do all of these um, handholding through quarterly monitoring and evaluation and learning sessions with our community partners. So we will not let them go. So we will ensure that as the project flies, we will be right there with them and supporting them all the way. Next, next question will be by Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you, Go team. Ahead. My question is regarding your, um, have you done any SWOT analysis? Uh, is there any threats related to this initiative? It looks great, but did you thought about the, the threats? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for that question. Well, um, well, actually, yes, uh, we've done already an assessment of that. Actually, that is also the reason why the pilot is necessary because we need to validate all of those. So some of the threats would actually be the the difficulty because in, in harvesting the water hyacinth, because right now the, the process is highly manual. However, we know that there are technologies available already that could actually harvest this um, automatically. I mean, there are um, aquatic vehicles that could actually harvest water hyacinth. However, there is really a need for us to pilot. That is the reason why there is a need for us to pilot in order to actually test these threats and validate them and ways to mitigate uh, these potential threats. Next question will be by Ms. Boram Kim. Hello everyone. Congratulations, first of all, for this uh, very um, um, thoughtful proposal. My questions are in twofold. One, you emphasize it's powered by volunteers, the power uh, through the power of volunteerism uh, to enhance community resilience to achieve this uh, project objective. Can you please tell us uh, one or two key characteristics of volunteerism that will make this project success? Because uh, just through um, just uh, engaging volunteers and also actually really tapping into the value of volunteering, I from my point of view it's slightly different. So I would ex I would like appreciate if you could clarify that. And usually we say in the United Nations volunteers volunteerism is a two way street. So you have something to offer out of your voluntary will, but also you want to gain something from this uh, contribution. So what do you think the volunteers who will be engaging in this project will gain. Thank you, over. Volunteerism in the Philippines is a very vibrant and alive. And it is seen in the most basic um, clusters of households and communities. So it's very innate for Filipinos. Sometimes um, they don't even need any um, anything in return. They don't need any um, financial compensation, and that's what volunteers are. And it's very um, natural for uh, many Filipinos to volunteer. But I think when they um, volunteer for uh, this project, uh, particularly, they will realize that they're not just helping to develop a new uh, stream of livelihood or income, but they are also protecting their health in the long run, because the water lilies um, also offer, uh, also have um, health threats. Um, such as uh, the waterborne diseases um, that are found along the lake. So that is the benefit that we will try to uh, surface as they volunteer, that this is not just a one-way street, as you've mentioned, but this uh, project will also have gains um, in the future. Thank you. In a, yeah, in addition to what Nick said, actually, we have we will be tapping onto local engineers. So we have engineers, uh, vo volunteer engineers of the Philippines, where they can actually scale their inventions that are already existing. So these are existing technologies that can actually further develop because of this pilot study. So in, in that case, we are able to actually help them have a venue to actually expand their current uh, work. So through, through, through the application of new technologies that they've already produced and developed, such as uh, the picture that you will find here 
is um, one of our engineer volunteers, Dr. Orge. He actually invented, he's helping communities of farmers um, have a livelihood opportunity, which he invented actually an equipment that could actually help um, with the process, the carbonizing, uh, carbonization process. Uh, one last thought, um, we can also tap into the very strong volunteering spirit in the parent company, Manila Water Company, and all our business units. Many employees uh, want to um, have a deeper meaning in what they do, aside from the nine to five in the office. Um, bringing them to these communities that are marginalized will really expand and challenge their engineering skills and abilities. And that is where we shall lead them. And uh, so you will see the dynamic uh, volunteer areas from the communities themselves, the technical volunteers, the service volunteers, the youth volunteers who will be invited in the future, or maybe we can invite UN volunteers to be part of this project. And um, so these, uh, the different dynamics, the different age groups that you can invite will really enrich Project Lilia. Thank you. Thank you, Team Manila. I'd like to remind you that we have less than four minutes left and two more judges to ask questions. I'd like to call Ms. Maitha Mansouri for the next question. Uh, hi, thank you, Sally. Uh, I think they answered my uh, question. I was thinking about the future and the next step and they uh, really give it a clear uh, idea about it. Good luck for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maitha. Uh, next up is Mr. Mohsen Gal. Please go ahead and ask me your question. Uh, well done, Bess and Nathaniel, for the presentation on behalf of your group. Uh, my question is around your earning model. If hyacinths are a common resource for a certain community, how does an individual community member earn back from such a model? So the actual the yeah thank you for that question Mosen. Now the 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 livelihood opportunity will actually employ the workers, so that will actually allow for them to have a, a an opportunity to have to earn something, uh, as well as the sales that they will also get from actually distributing these biochar. So it's the employment opportunity within their own community. Okay, perfect. Thank you and good luck Team Manila Water Foundation. Please unshare your presentation as we will be calling next. Um, our next team is De La Salle College of St. Benilde. Um, again, I'd like to remind you that you have five minutes to present and good luck. Hello everyone, we are from De La Salle College of St. Benilde. Uh, one of our team, mem team members will be doing the Filipino Sign Language Interpreter for the Filipino Deaf community who are watching us right now. Okay. Two weeks ago, Super Typhoon Rolly left a massive devastation in the Philippines. Thousands of families were affected and properties were destroyed. Today in the Philippines, we are experiencing massive rains because of Typhoon Ulysses. There are even warnings of possible storm surge. The Philippines experienced at least 20 typhoons a year, and in 2019, the Philippines suffered 16,382 fires, and there are also threats to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions as the Philippines is located in the Pacific Ring of Fire. This makes the Philippines the third most disaster-prone disaster country in the world. In this various crisis situation, it is important to reflect how many of these casualties were actually senior citizens persons with disabilities who are the most vulnerable. They end up being neglected, abandoned, and in most cases, excluded in most humanitarian efforts. And their situation and stories are often ghost unreported in the media. And the current COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated their vulnerability. In the Philippines, persons with disability and senior citizens are not allowed to go out of their homes because of the high risk of being infected. And so the pandemic has lessened their mobility and independence. So how do we then address this problem? Of course, we address it through volunteering. And in the last few years, a new breed of volunteers has emerged, millennials and Gen Zs. Like all volunteers, they have compassion for vulnerable communities, passion and commitment to serve. But what makes them different is their use of technology to find solutions to unmet needs of vulnerable communities. 
technology and compassion. And it is through this combination that we have come up with a solution to provide support, reassurance, care, and monitoring of senior citizens and persons of disability in crisis situation. Project Lika, Ligtas Ka at Handa mobile app, or in English, Safe and Ready mobile app. It is a free mobile app that links persons with disability and senior citizens to community volunteers. By clicking on the app, persons with disability and senior citizens can request support, reassurance, and care, and a team of community volunteers organized by Dallasal College of St. Benilde and our partner Barangay will then respond to the request. And the app has four features. Pasabay, which is request to purchase and delivery of goods, medicines, and other essentials. Emergency rescue. Health and wellness, such as telemedicine, therapy, caregiving, and updates on weather, flood water levels, and community activities. The app also serves as a monitoring device to ensure that senior citizens and persons with disability are not left behind during crisis situations and they will receive emergency rescue and care. The app will be free and will be user-friendly, easy to navigate and with low bandwidth to make it accessible to low-income groups and those with limited internet connection. The app will be developed by our volunteer students, faculty, and staff. We envision that through Project Lika mobile app, we will be able to address the problem faced by persons with disability and senior citizens in crisis situation. That is providing them with support, reassurance, and care during crisis situation. And we hope that this will be the norm for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, team. We'll go to the judges to start asking questions. We'll start with Mr. Aziz. Yeah, thank you very much. That was amazing. Uh, the question goes to that bit, where you're going to bring the faculty or the people who need to work full time in the background of the is it really people who are going to work full time or is it built for volunteering uh, completely? Oh, yes. Yes. In De La Salle College, De La Salle College of St. Pinit, we have a volunteer program for our faculty, our staff, and our students. So they usually, we usually recruit volunteers to do community service, to do special projects to various communities. So this is just a continuation of what they do for us. So they can actually, this is actually, they do this in their free time. So they usually would schedule their community volunteer work with us. So this is not something new. This is something that is part of the culture of our institution. Thank you. Next up, Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you so much. Actually, I have two questions. One, have you done any analysis when it comes to IT literacy? Because you have mentioned that those are for senior people and how they will be able to use apps and, you know, to click on it. So did you do any benchmark regarding the IT uh, literacy that they have? Oh, in the Philippines, uh, people are very adept in social media. Uh, but for senior citizens, they are quite um, not because they are not digital natives. So we actually uh, plan to make it, we're, we're, we actually plan to have a community volunteer in the barangay or in the village that would be the person that they can consult if they have problems with uh, the app. And at the same time, in Benil, we have a degree, we have a course on information systems and computer applications. So they will be the ones who will be our uh, resource person in developing the app. Okay. My other question regarding your next steps, you have mentioned that in December, you would need to develop a survey tools. What are you trying to capture from that survey? We are trying to capture the specific needs of senior citizens and um, persons with disability because we want the app to be responsive to their specific needs because we are targeting not just persons with disability or senior citizens. We're specifically targeting low income persons with disability and senior citizens because Benil is situated in the center of Manila and we are surrounded by urban poor communities and we have been partners with them. So we want to ensure that the data that we get when we design the app will be something that is 
specific to their needs and appropriate to what they really need in the community. Thank you. Next judge will be Ms. Boram Kim. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations again uh, to this team as well. Uh, I also have two questions for you. Uh, I see the main activity as a developing an app for a specific purpose you just elaborated, targeting low-income families and senior citizens affected particularly by a crisis situation. Um, how do you think in terms of innovation? Because nowadays I think we're moving on from developing an IT uh, tool you know, uh, to think of an innovation. Uh, in terms of your market analysis, are you sure this is a cutting edge tool to serve the needs, uh, the most vulnerable in this case? And also from developing the app and um, to actually be able to say the real impact in these communities that you are proposing to support, um, what's, the, what's in between? You know, how do you measure the success in terms of real impact at the end of the initiative? Thank you. Okay, so, so we will be developing the app. Yes, for us, it is innovative because there has not been a technology that is really geared in serving communities of low-income families. Basically, in the Philippines, it's mostly middle class and upper class who gets to be served. So this is an innovative project because it really targets the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable in the Philippines. In terms of measuring the impact, because aside our after we develop the app, we are planning to organize together with our partner, Barangays. Barangay is a, a village in the Philippines. Um, we are planning to organize volunteers who will be the one to provide the services that the persons with disability and senior citizens will be uh, needing. No? So that is a form of uh, impact that you are organizing the communities to be empowered and to help each other. And at the same time, for our, on the part of the school, the students and the faculty and the staff who will develop the app, it's also a way for them to apply their expertise into something that is not just for the corporate world, but for really for the income, low income families that is not being, that has not been served by technology. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Bianca Fodor. Thank you very much uh, to the team for this excellent uh, presentation and for making it so inclusive. That's absolutely great. My question uh, is about the community volunteering engagement. So how do you plan to sustain this engagement of volunteers that you have mentioned before throughout the whole project? Have you thought of any particular strategies for the different types of volunteers? that um, might be involved in your project. So if you could talk us through a bit on that point, please. Thank okay, you. Good. So De La Salle College of St. Benilde has been partners with different uh, barangays in here. I know. So we've been partners with them and we have been, they have been volunteering with us on different levels, but this will be more of the organized uh, volunteering work. So as volunteers, they actually will undergo training they will also have where we will negotiate with the barangay that they will also have specific small um, personal allowance for them to be able to to be able to do these services because the local government has budget for this has budget for services for persons with disability persons with um, senior citizen but in most cases this has not the budget has not been uh, given to them. So this is also a way for us. So when we organize the volunteers, we will be tapping into the budget of the local government to be able to provide um, honorarium or tokens for the, for, the, um, for the volunteers. And at the same time, it's also a way for them to, to personally grow you know, because you will be undergoing trainings, you will be exposed to different people. So it's also a way of uh, developing their personality and their status also in the community that you are someone who is contributing to the good to the betterment of your community. Next question will be from Ms. Meita Almansuri. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, the application. Uh, I don't know if you take a care or you think about uh, two kinds of disabilities like the blind and the sign language. Uh, if the application is friendly for them and they can reach it and they can use it, especially the blind. 
Uh, and also it's a comment like uh, there is a people from disability they cannot use a smartphone. Uh, did you consider uh, any another way for them to connect to you in this application? That's it. Yes, yes. Uh, actually in the development of the app, we will be consulting. It's not only Benil who will be, of course our volunteers will develop, but maybe we'll be, we will be working with different organizations, working with persons with disability. In Benil, we have a school for the deaf. So of course they will be one of our resource group. And then we will be working also with uh, the blind community and different persons, different organizations working with persons with disability and of course the senior citizens. So in the development of the app, it's not just Benil who will be just developing the app. We will be working with different organizations because we do not have the monopoly of, of knowledge regarding PWDs and persons with disabilities and senior citizens. So we will be working with them in developing even the database tool and then the mobile app. Um, that's it. Last but not least, Mr. Mahsengal. Uh, thank you, team uh, Safe and Ready, for a very insightful presentation. I have two very short questions. Firstly, around uh, how to ensure the safety of your volunteers. Do you have a user verification process built in the app? And secondly, uh, there you said the emergency service provision would also be an option. So do the volunteers or care providers get training into first aid or medical assistance? Yes, they will be given. Uh, yes, the volunteers will be given training uh, uh, in this rescue because we will also be working with local government like the Philippine Red Cross, the Bureau of Fire Protection. So it's not just Benil who will be doing this. We will be involving other groups. So yes, they will undergo training. Thank you to the Dilisal College of St. Benil, Philippines team. I wish you the best of luck. I'd like you to turn off your sharing screen so we can call our next team, which is the Bumi team from India. You may now begin your five minutes of pre presentation. Good luck. Doug, you're on mute. Hi, I'm Dr. Prahaladan from Bhumi. I'm here to present about our project, Lead Community. I'm one of the founders of this organization. I started this with a group of college students in 2006. We started teaching at an orphanage. The program now benefits 5,000 plus children. About 1,200 volunteers teach every week in shelter homes across India. In 2012, we started our civic initiatives platform to make volunteering a national habit in India. The program now engages about 25,000 volunteers across 30 cities of India annually. I would like to call your attention to our slum community development program, where we run 25 after school community centers in slums across Chennai city. Every day, children come there after school for their education. I would also like to share the story of one of our beneficiaries. Dinesh joined as a student in our computer program in 2008, started volunteering at the same center in 2011, and has been leading the center for the last few years, benefiting children from communities around him. Dinesh and I are from the city of Chennai in South India. Uh, it's a tier one city uh, with 30% of the population live in slum communities. These people are dependent on government social security, including health, education, nutrition, and for cash transfer for their living. As evidenced by our experience during the Chennai floods of 2015, the cyclone of 2018, and the COVID crisis, these people have nil or no savings, nil or reduced earnings during the crisis, pushing them further to the brink. What we know about them, they live in dilapidated houses, literacy is poor, and they have very poor access to clean drinking water and toilets. But what, is, uh, what we also know is that India has a very high mobile penetration rate, and we are expecting 800 plus million users to be having access to 3G or 4G internet by 2023. Our project brings the best in all of these and aims to create more Dineshes. Over to you, Harshini. Thank you, Doc. Community building has always been at the heart of our organization. Lead Community, our idea, is a tech-supported community network to enable self-reliant volunteering teams, resilient communities that understand the need of the people, handle crisis situation and respond with care. 
we aim to marry technology to our efforts which would facilitate real time communication of our efforts to the people and vice versa and technology will, su will, will support vernacular languages and then hence maximizing our reach the crisis has taught us that our effort needs to have long term application hence we aim to undertake capacity building programs such as leadership development and crisis response amongst a few of our initiatives in order to sustain additional initiatives of the community themselves and make them truly self sustaining we would we would equip them to fundraise on their own and provide additional support by matching their con by matching their contribution and funds raised our focus is to supplement their efforts and build a resilient community in order for our project and our idea to be to have a long run impact we will be partnering with other organization to co create initiatives build a culture of continuous learning through our trainings and foster leadership use the technology to increase the awareness among the communities incentivizing the communities to collaborate and take up initiatives themselves in order to be financially sustainable we would be we would set aside 2% of the funds we would also undertake other csr initiatives coming down to the question why choose us Bumi is best positioned to implement this project given our strong volunteer base, large partner network, our existing presence in the community, and being the biggest volunteering network organization in Chennai. We have our presence in 30 plus cities in India, and also given that 2.2 million of the people in in Chennai are urban poor. Our model also has a technological platform which encourages collaboration among various stakeholders, be it within the community, be it with Boomi or other partner NGOs. We believe we will make the best use of the funds allocated to us should we win this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Boomi team. Uh, we will now go to the uh, judges' questions. The first question is from Mr. Aziz Al Amiri. Yeah, thank you, team. That seems or looks amazing. Uh, the question I have here is: What are the challenges or the risks that you can see for coming, or that might face the team initially when implementing this? Thank you, Drew. Do you want to take that? Yes. So uh, thank you for that question. So initially, we the issues that might we might face is the uh, lack of a hyper local NGO partnerships, which can help us to uh, uh, build the platform. And the other problem, major threats that we see, is the misappropriation of the data that might be uh, big of an issue because we do not want to expose our volunteers' data to uh, in the wrong hands, and that is one of the. things which we see as a biggest threat to our implementation model given that we'll be using that particular uh, data and it will be shared amongst various partner organizations and which will also enable organizations to uh, utilize that particular data to initiate their own uh, community initiatives so one of the issues that we see is the misappropriation of data uh, how we plan to uh, uh, overcome that issue is uh, we plan to uh, confer to the strict guidelines of the uh, gdpr and the gxp guidelines to make sure that the data is very securely held within bhumi and only relevant data has been shared with the uh, partner organizations thank you team the next question will be from mr abdullah shahi Thank you so much, Sally. And my my question was the same question as Mr. Abdul Aziz. So I'll I'll pass it to the next judge. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Then we'll take next question from Miss Boyam Kim. Thank you very much, the team from Bumi. It was really interesting to hear your presentation. My question is about having in mind the sustainability in terms of fundraising. Uh, one of your slides show the one-on-one -on -one matching. fundraising support from the corporate social responsibility programs that you have with your partners could you elaborate a little bit how realistic this is uh because it's uh i mean it's a plan or you have a concrete partners lined up to support this specific initiative that will be helpful thank you so our plan is to enable the communities to fundraise and we have a large csr support network we raised over a million dollars last year from csr funding 
and uh, some of the corporates already fund us for our community interventions. So very confident about raising the matching grant for the uh, funds the communities raise. Thank you. Next question will be from Ms. Bianca Fadel. Thank you to the team for the excellent presentation as well. My question is about the scale of, of the project because you mentioned uh, the potential reach to 2.2 million people, but um, uh, have you really taken into account different stages uh, for that reach to be um, uh, possible or how are you looking at the scale of your project, please? So we're currently working in 25 uh, slum communities uh, within Chennai city. Uh, we hope to start the program immediately in all those locations. And next year to 10 of the uh, wards, you can see the map of Chennai. It is geographically divided into 15 locations. In third year, it will go to 15 places. In future, we want to scale it to other places, other cities. Bumi is already present in 30 cities, so we hope it shouldn't be a challenge to scale across India. Thank you again. Uh, next question will be from Ms. Meethal Mansouri. Um, there is no question. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you, the team. Okay. Then we will take our last question for the group from Mr. Mohsen Gal. Uh, thank you, Team Bhumi, for this presentation. My question is around, uh, I actually have two questions. First is with your umbrella model, it seems like you're trying to achieve uh, a lot of targets in terms of reach out and in terms of projects you wish to do. So how would you take platforms uh, help in measuring such impacts. And my second question is around, uh, what do you offer to other organizations apart from your volunteer network? Do they also bring in their volunteer networks? And how does data sharing work in that? Regards? Thank you. Can you repeat the first question? Uh, yeah, so my question was around uh, in terms of uh, your impact measurement. So how would your tech solution help measure some of your indicators? Okay, so, uh, the idea is to work with the community and the communities take up projects and uh, our impact measurements around number of projects, number of volunteers engaged. These volunteers are engaged throughout the year so that during a crisis, they are already active in the community and ready to respond. Have you answered the question? Are you done? No, uh, I guess it's internet is stuck. I'll, I'll take yeah. it up. You may go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Moshin, for the question. Uh, we are, we have to have a few KPIs set for our, uh, our interventions, like number of volunteers, number of event, number of, uh, things we, need, we want to engage. At the same time, we are also looking at how do we scale our uh, current leadership uh, model and uh, also turning volunteers into leaders so that uh, when, when, we, when we hit by crisis, it's not just uh, the volunteers, but also local leaders who can uh, take up things and uh, work, on, work on crisis situation immediately with a quick response. Okay. Thank you for the Bumi team from India and best of luck. Uh, next up, before we go to the break, will be the Forget Me Not Alzheimer's team from UAE. You may now begin your five minute presentation. Best of luck. Not. Apologies, we are uh, no worries. Just to avoid wasting your time. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for 
for uh, for hosting us today. Uh, we would like to tell you the story of Mr. Hafiz Rida. Mr. Hafiz Rida is an accountant. Mr. Hafiz has worked a long and productive life in finance. He used to meet people every day. He used to engage in meetings, socialize with his workers and co-workers at home and at work, and it was a perfect life. Uh, 10 years ago, Mr. Hafiz, apologies. Um, Eli, we can't uh, see your presentation. We are sorting this out immediately. Here we go. Yeah. So this is Mr. Hafiz. You know a bit about him now. Let's proceed. So Mr. Hafiz has led a long life. Uh, it's been a, a very productive career. He's been an accountant and he has uh, engaged daily during his business life in meetings and socialized with workers and led a very engaging and stimulating career. 10 years ago, Mr. Hafiz retired. He looked forward to spending a lot of time with his family and friends and to live out his golden years. However, it has turned out that retirement isn't what it's cranked up to be all the time. He has been uh, constantly bored and the boredom of isolation has taken on days and days and his has started to be very frustrated and uh, very nervous and clearly very unhappy and his family has been quite concerned about him. Now I'd like to take a look at Mr. Hafez over here. He's happy, he is reconnected, he is meeting new friends on a daily basis. And I'd like to ask yourselves, how is it that Mr. Hafiz has transitioned from this very lukewarm uh, uh, um, uh, retirement into this current state? Three years ago, Mr. Hafiz met Forget Me Not Alzheimer Organization, who for the past seven years have been leveraging their uh, um, volunteers to conduct groups and meetings and meetups to socially re-engaged seniors and to ensure they are mentally stimulated to uh, uh, delay the onset and prevent the onset of Alzheimer's. In reality, uh, the, our idea stemmed from a very simple uh, uh, concept, the concept of a vector, which connects a single point of value through different variables to an end point. For us, obviously, the most important single point of value are our seniors. And our volunteers are our variables who work to empower our communities and to optimize resilience and sustainability. But in reality, Mr. Havis isn't alone. Mr. Havis is part of 147,000 seniors in the UAE. 20,000 of them live with uh, Alzheimer or dementia. And this costs $8.1 billion to the UAE economy in terms of uh, formal and informal care, medication, treatment, and also impact on the workforce when uh, 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 people and carers leave the community, leave the workforce to stay at home to support their, their, uh, um, uh, their seniors. We look to solve this issue through leveraging a platform. So our solution is a platform called Vectors, which is a mobile application that allows volunteers and seniors to create, schedule, and sign up to social engagement events. Now, these can take the form of uh, online or offline activities, gamification, knowledge transfer, and a lot of different models as well. And it's very really important to keep in mind here the positioning of our platform, which addresses a lack of platforms for small business-led and social engagement efforts. There is also a sustainability uh, perspective to our platform because it works whether there's a crisis or whether there is no crisis. And during a specific crisis, in the immediate uh, uh, happening of the crisis, because it's a technology, it's used on mobile phones, uh, 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 location and other type, device, uh, other type of features can also come into play, as well as going into the aftermath of this particular crisis. Now, we feel this aligns quite nicely with our vision and our mission, which work to support and increase the, re the resilience of our senior, uh, senior members to prevent Alzheimer's by leveraging our community of volunteers to reduce the isolation and the lack of engagement of these, of these seniors. You might be familiar with the concept of nothing for us without us. Uh, this is something that's very close to our heart and our intention is to leverage our seniors and our volunteers who are professionals like Mr. Rada, the accountant, for example, to help us 
can keep this, the platform up and running and deliver the day-to-day -day services that we expect to deliver through it. Now, when it comes to social... Sorry to not... interrupt you, Eli, but just a reminder, we only have a couple of seconds left for the presentation. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, our, uh, our experience for the return on investment, uh, considering the application is a social investment effort, and in terms of why should we win? Because we are a very diverse group of people who leverage many years of experience working in this field to support our volunteers, to support our volunteers and our seniors. And here you have a photo of Mr. Rida having a lot of fun and meeting new friends and families. And we hope to invite you to the next uh, event that we will be holding. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for getting me not. That was awesome. Let's go to our first question. Again, we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Our first question is from Mr. Aziz Al Amri. Thank you very much for getting me not. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds a very good idea. And the thing I was looking for in your presentation now is where could be the success factor for this idea so that it will really have it, its impact in the community and the targeted uh, audience? Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. Very good question. In reality, uh, uh, there are some metrics around uh, um, how many hours of engagement per week and per month uh, uh, would lead to how long of a uh, postponement or, or uh, um, the deferment of the onset of Alzheimer. So through the application, we are able to, uh, 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 to use these metrics to calculate how many hours of engagement is are certain people taking, are certain people engaging in, and therefore be able to estimate uh, uh, whether this person is more or less likely to develop Alzheimer, at least from the perspective uh, of their social engagement and their mental stimulation. And in addition to that, we are also able to calculate a certain return on investment that is a bit more calculated than the just five times the social investment, the, the initial investment. Because in reality, when we know that 22,000 people in the UAE have uh, Alzheimer or dementia, and we know the amount of money the economy spends to support them, then we can easily calculate what would be the savings on the economy if we were to, uh, um, uh, to defer or to delay the onset of of Alzheimer of let's say 10 people or 20 people or 100 people who have engaged so and so hours per month or per week through the platform. Next question is from Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have a question related to the user journey. I wanted to understand how those senior will uh, use this platform or the app, mobile app and uh, register uh, in this application, how they will use it? Absolutely. That's a very good question, Amdala. Thank you very much. So our application and the platform that it supports will be fully accessible, meaning they will be workout compliant, but also go beyond workout compliance into inclusive design of these particular platforms. And that's specifically to address some of the threats that turned up in our threat, uh, uh, in our SWOT analysis, which is do seniors, uh, do they feel comfortable dealing with this application? Can they go on and access it? So the way we've analyzed this is that because it will be a very simple platform, because it will be available on a website as well as, on, on, as an application, and because of its design that is fully accessible, then whatever residual amount of friction in terms of use would actually be quite valuable, because that will serve as a men additional mental stimulation for our community of seniors to further engage their cognitive abilities and further delay the onset of Alzheimer. So that is from, a, from an accessibility perspective. Now, in terms of a user journey, it's actually quite straightforward. Uh, both the volunteers and their multiple tiers or the user, the, 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 uh, the seniors who are the ultimate beneficiaries of the platform, they can go up on the platform, onto the application and schedule meetings, schedule group events that other seniors can sign up to and that volunteers can also sign up to. And this is a very streamlined affair, so it's not very complicated to do. And in reality, it allows them also to set the channels through which they want to conduct this activity. 
For example, now it's a pandemic. This is a crisis. We cannot meet face to face. We'll meet online through Zoom or through any other feature. And later on, hopefully after the pandemic, uh, 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 you know, uh, says goodbye and good riddance, to be honest, we'll be able to reconduct these things uh, face to face. Uh, or for example, these groups can be structured based on uh, location. So people in your area, they can be structured based on uh, preferences. So if somebody would like to start a group, uh, a group for a literature group, a theater group, any other group like that, those things will also help make the user interface and the user journey a bit more familiar to those who need to use it. Okay, next, next question is from Ms. Buram Kim, and we have uh, six minutes until uh, we finish. Go ahead, Ms. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and for getting me not uh, project team. It was very interesting. In the interest of time, I will be very brief. I think this intergenerational cooperation in the age of uh, sustainable development with a, a set of global complex challenge, I think it's very significant and quite neglected area. So I appreciate the idea. My question is, if you give me one line of what the senior person with Alzheimer will gain from this or what we want, uh, what the person will want and what the young person who will volunteer through this project will want or gain from this project. Very briefly, maybe 10 seconds for each side. Okay. In reality, our, uh, our users aren't only, uh, our main focus is to ensure the prevention of Alzheimer's. So our main focus is on the uh, 416,000 people who do not yet have Alzheimer's in addition to considering that Alzheimer is a spectrum, it's not an on-off kind of thing. So it's a journey, it's a degenerative disease. Uh, in terms of the, the linkage between the users and the, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, volunteers and the seniors, this will be a seamless, a, a seamless journey really, because in reality, uh, the community of seniors would also want to contribute themselves. These are professionals, fresh out of, fresh out of, uh, out of work. So this is something that we see as a two-way street where volunteers get to benefit from the training which will be provided and they will also be uh, 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 they will benefit from certain paid positions to help run the organize the, uh, the the platform itself as well as the seniors who will benefit from that and in, in addition to that we have to keep in mind that there are multiple revenue streams which we are bringing together to ensure sustainability of the uh, of the platform so for example certain crowdfunding events uh, uh, because there's this concept that you know seniors are all broke and they have no money, uh, which is sometimes the case, but sometimes it's not the case. And these people would want to contribute. They they're out there. They've worked all their life. They they have no problem supporting these kind of uh, these kind of uh, um, elements. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I've answered all your questions. The last part escaped me. Uh, feel free to answer to to ask again if you'd like. Okay, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. Uh, next is Miss Bianca Fadel. Thank you very much. My question is just a follow up from, from Baron's question really in relation to the engagement of volunteers. So in addition to the trainings that you have just mentioned, how do you plan to keep up this uh, volunteer engagement in your project? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. That's a very good question again. So in reality, we see the engagement of, of volunteers in multiple aspects. We already have existing connections, just like many of the groups who presented before us, with existing uh, organizational uh, uh, organizational institutions like universities and and uh, CFO and uh, a private organizations through their CSR activities. So that's something that will uh, we hope provide a constant stream of of volunteers. But also the training which will be provided in and of itself to ensure that these volunteers are able to organize properly, moderate properly, and so on and so forth, we feel will add a lot of value to their CVs, which will make it quite appealing for them. Uh, additionally, let's not forget that this is about the organization, correct? But we are actually leading these events. So if we say, for example, there is a, a book club that is being, that is this book club event, for example, uh, are likely to be people who might be have a penchant towards literature, for example. So that is also a self-fulfillment kind of a benefit for them as well, because they will be there and they will attend. There are many of our seniors who are uh, marketing experts. There are many of our seniors who have worked for 30 years as, as accountants, as so on and so forth. Yeah. And some of these activities will also lead direct benefit to them. And there are some students, for example, in certain, uh, in certain uh, academic programs uh, like psychology, uh, uh, like uh, 
uh, social engagement, like marketing, who might also benefit from working in such a platform. Because in reality, if you can market a platform like this, then it is, it's like being in a in a, in a an internship to some respect, even though this uh, the interaction here will not be formally an internship engagement. Thank you, Eli. Next is uh, the question from Ms. Mitha. Uh, hi, thank you, team. Uh, really, I like uh, the intro. Uh, you use uh, half as uh, a face for your project, and it's very clever uh, idea. And it's a general question: Why it's important to have a platform for them. Thank you, thank you. That's a very, very good question. Um, in reality, uh, uh, by the way, uh, how is, it, is, it, is an actual, you know, he's, he's one of our, he's one of our uh, seniors who works directly with us. So this is an, a, genuine, a genuine story here. Uh, um, uh, the reason why we thought this platform is created, should be created is because in addition to the, you know, obviously the core value which it provides, but it really gives uh, a grassroots uh, 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 efforts, a, a, an outlet to express themselves, because there are there are a number of maybe like volunteer platforms in the UAE, obviously. Um, but a lot of times, this might be a bit daunting to uh, you know one person who'd like to volunteer or one person who'd like to create a small group for four or five people or for the neighbor you know down the road. <coughs> So we feel this platform with a specific, specific positioning towards grassroots community-led volunteering effort will tap uh, uh, that particular uh, low-level, low-scale type of uh, uh, volunteering effort and community-based activities, which might not be very comfortable uh, going with uh, initiatives uh, that, have, that need 20,000 volunteers or 50,000 volunteers or thousands of volunteers. I just want to go and help a couple of people. I don't want to go with... 20,000 uh, 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 volunteer efforts, which are fantastic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry to cut you up. I know uh, there's a lot to say about this, but we still have one more question and we're already out of time for your group. Uh, mm -hmm. But still, we're going to take uh, the quest the last question uh, from Dr. from Mr. Mohsen Gull. Um, please make the answer uh, quick and short. Go ahead, Mr. Mm -hmm. Uh, too much pressure on me to ask a quick question, but quickly, what are some of the additional features of Vector apart from uh, events? Are, have you thought of games or mental exercises, things like that? Absolutely. Thank you, Mahsin. I'll make it brief. Uh, there's, uh, there's a number of features. For example, knowledge sharing. Now, during a COVID-19, people would have wanted a place to, to get reliable information. That's one. There's a number of integrations which can be made down the road. For example, integrating with health wearables, which is quite a concern for seniors, for example. There will be a gamification exercise, a, 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 a ver a, um, aspect to the application itself to help, again, senior keep mentally challenged and uh, mentally um, stimulated. Uh, there will be a number number of um, badges, and those of you, the young ones around uh, in our groups will know this, there's a number of badges that can be given, for example, for participating in 10 events or for doing 10 activities, like when the first time you, you went on Audible and listened through the night, for example, you get, you know, badges and, and things like that. And off the top of my head, these are some of the things which we intend to put here to first to give value, provide additional value, but also keep a game, a game fun environment to engage people to come back and continue engaging with our work. Thank you so much, Eli, and thank you for the Forget Me Not uh, group. Um, this was fun. Um, okay, so now it's time for the 15-minute uh, break, um, after which we will continue with the remaining teams. Um, we will see you here in 15 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not muted yet. Wait, wait. I'm not muted yet. <laughs>
Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, break has ended, and now we are back to the presentations. I'm going to remind you to keep your video and your microphone off, and only the team who will be presenting will turn on their mics and their video. Uh, we will now call the next team to present their proposal, the Rwanda Volunteer Network from Rwanda. You may begin now. Your five minutes begin. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Denise, and I am representing the Rwanda Volunteer Network. Yes. Um, first of all, to begin with, we had the challenge. But before I begin, I'd like all of us to ask, as what Martin Luther King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And we had a challenge, which is how can we ensure that those in our community who are vulnerable can be supported, reassured, cared for, and monitored during a time of crisis when their channels are unavailable or curtailed. So straight to what we as Rwanda Volunteer Network will do. First of all, groups that are considered particularly vulnerable by the government of Rwanda, they are children under the age of five, elderly people aged 60 and above, and people with disabilities. The percentage of poverty in the Chumbi district is 49%, 49.3%, uh, which is above the national average of 45%. And the percentage of extreme poverty in Rwanda is 33.3%. And this is the highest in Northern province where this district is located. And basically this LU faces often in times floods and landslides and other natural disasters, which is why we came up with a solution to the challenge that we were given. Now, our solution is rays of hope and in Kinyaranda, it's Mirasire Dirindiro. And allow me to clearly explain what we are going to do as Rwanda Volunteer Network through this idea of rays of hope. Rays of hope will be a one-year program that aims to strengthen 100 vulnerable youth and old headed families in Gichumbi district in Rwanda. And you may ask yourself, who are these people? Basically, the, these are the families that are either led by young children who cannot be, able, who cannot be employed in our country, Rwanda. And these old people who can also not be, imagine they can take, if they cannot take care of themselves, how are they going to take care of the rest of the families? That is why we came up with this idea as they are the head of the families. Now imagine if being the head of the family and not being able to be employed in Rwanda. That is a serious issue. We as Rays of Hope, we give hope to the household led by a minor or elderly people and show them that their dreams are valid and that they can achieve them. Rays of Hope uh, will engage these families through, uh, first of all, identification of these vulnerable families by their local leaders and the community volunteers, and they will be put into psychosocial support groups. Now, after being identified, we came up with another idea, which is family plan. If the families are already identified, these family, vulnerable families will now create their own personal and household dreams, whereby they'll be given space to write their dreams, to write what hearted them in their entire life, what are the dreams that they want to achieve or what do they want to achieve in life? And after now getting those results from the people or from these vulnerable families, we as Rwanda Volunteer Network, we want to organize, we will organize the trainings based on each, uh, on different groups that they created and their ideas. You cannot provide trainings to someone who doesn't need them. And you need to provide trainings according to their ideas, according to their goals. That is why we came up with this idea. We cannot go and provide the trainings if we don't have their goals that they want to achieve. And that in Rwanda Volunteer Network, we defined it also. After now training them, we will encourage them to implement the income generating project. This will be a result from the trainings. If the trainings are given, now after the trainings, what are you be able to do? In this, we will support them to implement the income generating and you can ask yourself why Please, sorry to interrupt you dear, but uh, reminder, you have only one minute, less than one minute left. Sure. 
Now, why Rays of Hope? Rays of Hope will be the difference maker when it comes to affording and helping our community. And through Randall Volunteer Network, we are a perfect fit because we are the only existing network with locally owned solution to volunteering for SDGs Agenda 2030 and 2060 in Rwanda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we'll take the first question from Mr. Aziz Al Amiri. Yeah, thank you, team. Uh, the idea is amazing. And the, uh, the thing I was searching for is how would you build the partnerships or who are the key partners for your idea to bring it on and make it sustainable? Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. As I said, Rwanda Volunteer Network is already an existing network, meaning we do have the, the different NGOs, the local NGOs that we are currently working with. We work with the government to help these vulnerable people. And the sustainability of this idea is because after providing the training, they'll be able now to implement this income generating project, which will lead not only them to rely on this one year program, but also to help their families which is, will be sustainable to sustain their families both economically and financially. Thank you so much. Thank you, Belize. Next question is from Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Just to build on, uh, thank you so much, first of all, uh, Raise for Hope for the presentation. My question is building on what uh, Mr. Aziz said. What about the uh, sustainability of your overhead cost? Uh, I mean, is it covered by the organization? how you will be generating funds to sustain the organization itself, not the, the vulnerable families. Sorry, I didn't get the question well. The question is, how are you sustaining the organization, Raise of Hopes, how you will be sustaining it, not uh, the family, the program cost and the running cost of the program itself? Yes, thank you so much. As I said, we being the winner of this uh, competition or being the winner or the idea you know we will have different funds from the, from the locally from the local government we will also have different we will have the first support from UA Ideaton network and then we'll also get support from the local NGOs as we are currently working we are already an existing network we will also fund that uh, through our own networks that we currently work with uh, we, we even have partners like Good Deeds Day, Global Pono Networks, Faith-Based Organizations, and Yave Networks. Those are networks that we mainly even still partners with that are going even to help us do it during, if we win this competition, even during uh, maintaining the sustainability of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next question by Ms. Boyan Kim. Thank you very much, the Rwanda team. Uh, uh, when you said uh, according to the needs and the goals by the vulnerable family themselves, that resonated with me a lot. So thank you for highlighting that. And it's quite refreshing to hear this grassroots, le grassroots level initiative led by uh, community members themselves. It's all good. My question is in your step-by-step -step, uh, work plan, it says first to identify vulnerable families and you know, support them with a psychosocial support. And then the next step is uh, you know, identify their needs and then goals and then provide them training. And then they come up with income generation projects. I think maybe you, know, you try, you are, I think it's a good thing to be ambitious. I think uh, there, there are a lot of important and you know, important elements here that uh, cannot be rushed, you know, when you address or support psychosocial elements and also livelihood income generation. So how are you going to balance these different significant needs to help address the uh, support needs by the vulnerable communities? Thank you. Okay, so you're asking how are we going to, to, to identify them, right? If I get the question well, yeah, because in your first uh, in in your proposal, it says you identify the families to be supported, and then provide them with a psychosocial support, and then and then also the next step is to 
give them training what they need in the areas of their needs and then let them come up with the income generation project. For me, these are two significant areas that we can all collaborate, partner with and support. Um, how are you going to balance these difficult um, areas uh, at the same time within a time frame of one year with a limited budget? Yes, actually, the first thing that we have is we, we are already working, as I said, we already have the volunteers in our community or in our network. So the way we are going to identify these people now, after identifying them, we, we already have these volunteers that are currently working. We also have one of our member who is currently in the room who will help us to implement this. Uh, like, as you saw, it's only a one year program. So uh, we, we already are ahead of the plan. We already planned all those and how the trainings will be offered. The only remaining thing is to get what do they really need? Cause you can't give the trainings to someone for example, educational training when the person needs another training. Uh, talking about the balance that we will be maintaining, it's not like you're going to provide anything. It's like when when one group is like in the need of like livelihood needs, another group will be coming with the need of education. Another group will come with the need of nutrition, like whether they have malnutrition. So we're going to provide them with according to their needs. And then the balance that like, it's one team might be needing more rest than another one. So it's not like we, we're going to divide them and then we'd be saying like, this team must use 200, another team 200. No, according to their needs, we'll be providing them according to their needs. If they have like a problem of nutrition, you can provide them with cows or something that they are able to, to lead with and uphold and it's going to help them with their need and problems. Also, if it's a problem of education, you can help them through advocation and provide them with needs that are going to contribute them to their education, which is an actual problem because mainly most of them and their education are 12 years based educations only, thank you. Sorry, Kim, to interrupt, but uh, uh, we need to keep the answers uh, short and quick because we only have less than four minutes to answer questions. Next up is Ms. Bianca Fadel. Thank you very much for the presentation. And as Baram said, for putting uh, the protagonism on the hands of the vulnerable and the communities, that's a really great um, uh, point. I would like to uh, follow up on the question about the monitoring and evaluation during this project. So how are you planning to evaluate if the project is achieving its objectives in the different uh, um, areas of, of the district? Or do you have any strategy that you could uh, uh, share with us please thank you on the on the monitoring of the project uh, when you look at the the sketch that we have provided is there will be the the manager the manager that is going to manage the project mainly and then we'll be having a financial manager that is going to manage the financial of the project too and then we'll be providing four volunteers that are going to be volunteering directly with the with these families these vulnerable families means uh, uh, on on the evaluation means like we be we be the one evaluating how the project is going to be when you look at it well we we have stated like in 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 6 month we have to to get an evaluation and even each month we have to get like a group or a group talking or like we'll be having like a meeting each month on looking whether trainings are, are being sustainable and are being useful after them, whether what we have provided, uh, they are being helpful, whether we are even, even providing the needs that they need. It's like we will be keeping on them. It's not like we'll be putting the project there and then we'll leave it there. We keep on even monitoring them monthly, 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 even after one year. Thank you. Thank you, team. Next question is from Ms. Meethan Mansouri. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rwanda volunteer. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, what is the goal you want to achieve it from this uh, project? Give me one goal.
our our goal is helping building a nation that cares. Sorry, like if I mentioned this well, is helping building a nation that cares, like which goes to our mission, which says that to motivate and develop effective volunteer link through consultation, training, information, and placement services to the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you again. Last but not least, Mr. Mohsen Gul with the final question before we wrap up. My question was already answered about identification of families, so no more questions. Uh, well done, team. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Thank you, team. Uh, next up is our following team. I'd like to call on the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago from Trinidad and Tobago. Go ahead. You have five minutes to present your idea. Thank you. She reached out. She called us. We fear to think what would have happened if we weren't there. The disruption caused by COVID-19 has curtailed the everyday lives of young people who did not have support. I want to draw your attention to the screen. Maya is a mentee in the Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago Mentorship Program. This is an email her mentor received on 29 September 2020 at 1.29 a.m. She's only 15 years old from a rural community in Trinidad and was raised in a dysfunctional family. She's one of 30 young persons in our mentorship program, but is also one of over 60,000 young people who have had their vulnerability amplified during COVID-19. The pandemic has isolated her from her regular support channels at school, her extracurricular clubs, and support from family and friends. We want you to think about the young people in your community, my community, and communities across the globe who are isolated and in need of new mechanisms to access support during this pandemic. The Me to We Mentorship Program realized the gaps in regular channels of support for vulnerable young people. So how do we increase access for more young people to have the kind of support Maya received in her darkest time? What if these young people had a reliable, trustworthy online community at their fingertips? What if you, Emirates Foundation, were part of this solution. Our vision is to pioneer the Me to We online mentorship platform. This platform seeks to scale our existing mentorship expertise from serving 30 young people across Trinidad and Tobago to meet the pressing needs of thousands of our youth in this time. This solution brings together the best of technology, skilled volunteers, and most importantly, a safe place for our youth. Imagine it, a fun and interactive platform, specially designed for Caribbean youth that provides, of course, a safe online space for connecting our vulnerable youth to a family of support and resources, which include automated mentor matching, automated safeguarding features, instant messaging, internal video calls, file sharing. It's a mobile friendly app, an activity hub. It has a customizable dashboard, and of course, a resource library. Such a platform currently does not exist in the Caribbean. And our preliminary findings show now that there's a strong demand for our solution by organizations serving young persons. This solution can be adaptable and scalable for youth anywhere. Me to We, which was established on the traditional donor dependent model, will be using this funding to evolve to a social enterprise model. This is based on a business to business approach 
where our software platform will be licensed and sold to organizations seeking to tackle youth development through mentorship. Organizations can access this platform for just five US dollars per month per mentee. That's the average cost of a basic meal for the nourishment of mentorship. Our goal is by year two to onboard organizations managing 200 mentees per month and grow to 500 mentees by year three, generating an estimated revenue of US $60,000 per year. COVID has provided an opportunity- Sorry to interrupt Giselle, we have a couple of seconds left. Sure. Our plan of action is to build this platform by June, 2021. And with 25,000 US, we will make this platform a reality. Maya needed us and we were there. Think of the thousands globally who need us. We will be there virtually. Will you be there? Thank you, team. That was awesome. We will now start with the 10 minute judges answers and quest uh, questions and answers. First question by Mr. Aziz Al Amiri. Yeah, thank you, me too. Um, <laughs> the question that uh, comes to my mind is, who could be the potential partners that will take the effective role in the mentorship part? Thank you. Yeah, so the market audience, um, who can be our potential partners, we are looking at government institutions, um, as well as other community-based organizations and non-profit organizations such as ourselves. We have a lot of amazing projects taking place in the Caribbean, um, but there's no platform that could really facilitate um, connection at a fingertip. Um, so we would like to market this, not only to our government, but to governments throughout Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the Caribbean, um, and also other NGOs and CBOs within our region and globally. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you, Me Too We Mentorship. I have a question regarding, have you done or developed any uh, guidelines or principles when it comes to cyber security, child protection? Um, is the, how you will be assuring that, that those mentors who will be registering in this platform are certified to be a mentorship. mentorship. Uh, are they eligible to give the right advice at the right time to those uh, vulnerable children as well? Absolutely, very important question. The Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago has a robust safeguarding and child protection policy that we would have implemented and are currently engaging through our pilot project, which currently is running. Um, for example, for our mentors, they would have gone through an extensive application and recruitment process, which included an application process, um, submission of documents, including where they work, their references, their certificate of good character, um, a mandatory um, interview process, and also a mandatory training process. Following the completion of that, they would have had the opportunity to review our safeguarding policy and sign a code of conduct before we can connect them to our vulnerable young people. Through our platform, we propose to re-engage and re um, increase our safeguarding policies. For example, our internal video calls will be monitored. We would like to develop a data analysis software that can analyze the, that can transcribe the video to audio and analyze that information uh, and flag any um, conversations that we believe are inappropriate or harmful to our young people. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, next question by Ms. Buram Kim. Thank you very much for that powerful introduction. I think I was very much moved. I think it's a really interesting initiative that you are proposing here. My question is, I think it's in one, it, uh, it was in one of the slides that you, you shared with us in advance, 
um, this, uh, the affirmation of your quality control, you know, sufficient training for all the mentors, I think that's much appreciated, much needed. My question is about, you know, you need to engage a range of expertise from education sector, who is uh, familiar with well-being, particularly that of youth, and also partnership, also some medical personnel for psychosocial support. Um, how, what's your strategy to ensure this, that there is a quality? I, I understand, if I understood correctly, they are volunteers probably, volunteering their time and knowledge and expertise. How do you ensure the quality, um, uh, you know, to ensure the well-being of young people that you're talking about in the Caribbean? And also, since uh, I was impressed with your ambitious plan, that you know, anyone in the world can be a partner, can adapt and can buy a license and use this app. From the inclusion perspective, do you have any thoughts already um, in terms of language? Because also, you know, when we talk about world and up to address the significant issue of mental well helping, sorry, mental health of young people, it's quite uh, important. So over. Sure. Sure, no problem. I will handle. Um, I will handle the first question, and then I'll hand over to my colleague Giselle to answer the second question. So currently, we have a steering committee of thirty experts, which includes a part-time project manager that is paid. Um, we also have experts as it relates to having a medical doctor and a psychosocial sub, um, support lead. We have. Uh, an m and &E lead, as well as marketing and strategic planning. So that currently exists right now. With the scaling of our project and the introduction of this platform, we will introduce uh, subcommittees um, of experts related to psychosocial support. And we would have outlined some of those organizations in our proposal. For example, the Children's Authority, the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists. Um, we also have a children, um, community mediation, sorry, and Childline. These organizations already exist within our local context to provide support for vulnerable communities, inclusive, inclusive of young people and their families. Um, so I'll hand over to Giselle Mendez to answer the second question. Sure. In terms of inclusion um, and our go-to-market strategy, um, we've definitely considered what that would look like, especially in terms of partner partners um, from territories that aren't English speaking. Now for us, one of the primary steps that we, that we see as important in terms of being able to scale this project is to establish a strong partnership with a software development company that can really be the technology lead in terms of developing this, um, this, this software tool and also being, um, being able to guide and lead on its adaptability across markets. The Volunteer Center of Trinidad and Tobago is an organization where we fundamentally, fundamentally believe in the principles around collaboration. Our, our model, our approach to developing interventions is centered on collaborations. And as we seek to scale this program, collaborations will be at the root and at the core of how we seek to do that. So to answer your questions, partnership with a technology company and very much building upon our steering committee of experts approach that we currently that we currently have in motion. Thank you, team. We have now three minutes left to answer questions. Next, next question from Ms. Bianca Fodder. Thank you very much for the very engaging presentation. That was excellent. And uh, my question very briefly is about feedback opportunities for volunteers to uh, actually uh, speak up about their own experiences. Have you considered that in your proposal and how so? Thank you. Sure. So in terms of um, our, our, on our current steering committee, there's a monitoring and evaluation specialist who's developed for our pilot program, a monitoring and evaluation framework, which not only considers the perspective, our, the perspectives and feedback of our volunteer mentors, but also the perspective and feedback of our mentees. For the pilot program, we've actively engaged our mentees at three touch points to assess how the program is working for them. What are their thoughts on their mentor? What do they believe they are gaining from this experience? What being part of this um, COVID online experience, virtual mentorship um, experience means to them? Because of course we understand this is a very new space 
our young people are in and we cannot come to assumptions about what they may be feeling. And what's very important to us is ensuring that as we continue to de develop the model, our young people are at the forefront of how that development continues to take place. So that feedback loop has been instilled from the pilot program via our monitoring and evaluation specialists and will continue to do so as this program scales. Thank you. Next question from Ms. Meitha Mansouri. One minute, heads up. <laughs> Ms. Metha, are you here? Okay, since Ms. Metha is not responding, we'll take the question from Mr. Mohsen Gal until we hear from Ms. Metha. Uh, great presentation, me to we mentorship and uh, excellent uh, thoughts on so many elements here. Uh, my question is around, have you already tested that the mentees are willing to pay $5 per month and if uh, you open up the platform as a paid platform, does it exclude certain youth groups in your population who may not be able to access this? Thing? Thank you. Great. Um, so just to clarify, the mentees won't be required to pay anything to access the platform. We, we understand that our mentees are highly vulnerable um, and their socioeconomic status doesn't facilitate um, their payment to access the platform. So it's really a business to business, organization to organization partnership that we will be pursuing. So we will be actively engaging governments um, via public sector, private sector organizations to really um, broaden the village. The Me Too We Mentorship Program very much sits upon the principle, it takes a village to raise a child. So we are demonstrating the value of what this virtual mentorship platform is already doing for 30 young persons. We are asking other organizations to join us on this journey and provide further support, much needed support to our young people in this time. So it's going to be a business to business, um, organization to organization um, arrangement that we'll be pursuing. Um, so they will be, um, they will cover those costs in terms of the mentees who will be um, engaging on the program. So, yes. Thank you team, thank you so much. Um, um, Smitha, are you here? Would you like to ask a question before we move on to the next group? Okay, uh, then let's move on to the next group. Thank you so much, team. That was amazing. Next up, I'm calling Better Living Health and Community Services from Canada. You may begin your five minutes presenting. Go ahead. Imagine for a moment if during this unprecedented time of the COVID pandemic, you had no access to the internet. Now imagine you're a vulnerable senior during this time. How Linda, sorry to interrupt you, but we yes. can't see your presentation. Oh dear, thank Can you. Presentation. Okay, apologies. No worries. Your screen, why is that a problem? My apologies. There, let's get it right. <laughs> okay, apologies, folks. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Now, imagine you're a vulnerable senior, housebound, how difficult it would be to, to access healthcare, grocery shopping, social activities. Maybe you have family living far away and you're not on the internet. Plus, you don't have a lot of money. Now, you, you might think of Canada as a relatively rich country but the older adults we're talking about are often marginalized. Maybe they're newcomers to Canada uh, or they have multiple uh, factors involved like language barriers, poverty, dementia, their health issues. Uh, it's a long list of, of problems. So the this, this situation affects all aspects of their well-being. It's, it's really an unseen crisis, both globally and locally. So our idea is we will reduce isolation of vulnerable older adults by providing them with internet access 
the hardware and software they would need and online go online support and going forward of volunteer virtual companionship. And we call this idea bridging the digital divide. And as you'll see the driving force in this program is the volunteers who will donate their time and knowledge to make it all happen. Better Living already provides a number of programs to support older adults, as you, you see on the screen, certainly emotional support, but they have everything from fall prevention classes to lots of social activities. And of course, since the onset of the, the pandemic, many of the programs have had to be curtailed, reducing access to both vital support and, and to fun, something everybody needs. And technology is becoming so ingrained in our lives that if you're not connected during these times, it's harder for you to access vital services and support. So we proposed an initial project with 100 older adults. This would entail a budget of $50,000, of which 25,000 would be an in-kind contribution from Better Living. And this will fund initial marketing efforts, the cost of some devices and internet access, and to support training costs in the first year. One key part of our marketing will be a broad distribution of postcards, posters. We want to find these target uh, clients through many different avenues. And, and one way we'd, we would do it would, would be through our Meals on Wheels and food bank delivery services that are already in place. And we've reviewed what's available out there in terms of uh, competition um, in the tech market for seniors. There's lots available, but it's usually at a pretty substantial cost. We would be one of the few organizations that would be in a position to integrate all of these services and then provide the, the participants with ongoing support from these volunteer virtual companions. That's the key. We thought through the roadmap of, uh, of what it's going to take, the steps to alleviate isolation and loneliness. And in, in terms of collaboration, there's so many potential partners in the areas of training and uh, obtaining devices at a, a subsidized cost or through donation and, and through accessing internet service. Regarding sustainability, we will be using refurbished devices where possible. And this concept is a fit with the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. When it comes to scalability, once it's developed, this program can be rolled out to organizations in the rest of Canada. And it's certainly not limited to seniors. It could be applied to other marginalized groups as well, once we have the training materials and the processes. Vulnerable seniors are, are certainly suffering during the pandemic. We, we need to intervene soon to alleviate this loneliness and lack of access to vital services. Better Living has more than 50 years uh, experience working with older adults. Our 730 volunteers between them speak over 30 languages to help in our service delivery. And in fact- no, Sorry to interrupt, but I just uh, want to give you a one minute heads up. Thank you. Um, most of our uh, volunteer workforce, uh, it, it, a lot of them are seniors themselves, and certainly able to participate and relate well to participants. And in fact, here's our project team. We have a diverse set of uh, lived experiences, cultures and skills, and these folks will be leading the volunteer committees going forward. So in, uh, in closing, please know that, that this team is absolutely fueled by purpose in this endeavor. We are engaged to serve. We're inspired to connect with people. And together, we, we know we can combat loneliness. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. OK, now let's move on to the judges' questions. And as usual, we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. First up, Mr. Aziz Al Amri. Yeah, thank you very much. That's interesting. And it looks so with deep uh, desire to serve. Uh, the question I have is, what do you see is standing on your way to deliver what you would like to deliver in your initiative? Thank you. Good question. Um, one of the first challenges is simply finding these individuals who um, you know, are, are wanting to, but not quite there in terms of connecting to the internet. So we can't 
publicize it online, we have to reach out in other avenues. So we've got, we've thought through, okay, how could we find these people? So certainly through our Meals and Wheels, as I mentioned, uh, dropping postcards in into uh, the delivery of that through social workers, through uh, family physicians and so on. So that just finding those folks is, is, a, is a barrier. We um, feel pretty confident that we can uh, tick the boxes in the other areas of, of obtaining devices and uh, getting a low cost internet package available. Next question by Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you so much for the great presentation and the holistic approach to the, to the issue. My question is um, how, based on the current situation of COVID-19 and the restrictions around it, how you will be able to achieve the first and the most important step, which is to giving those tra training to those el uh, older adults uh, with these restrictions of movement and uh, interaction with each other and the risk of them leaving their houses to go to the training house or whatever. So how, what's your plan to mitigate that uh, restrictions when it comes to the movement? Good question. We thought that through. Uh, we would engage uh, family members or caregivers where possible. And some of that might be needed to help us with interpretation uh, issues as well. Uh, in, in a final resort, it would be a, a, uh, a doorstep sort of training, <laughs> not for the, the trainer not to be coming in to the household, but um, sort of being at that the required six feet distance. Um, and, and hopefully some of it, once we get them engaged, they can, they can get online training with, with their one-to-one -one volunteer trainer. And this would be a training relationship. It wouldn't be a one-time thing. That trainer would be available to um, a, you know, help them through little issues as they as they become online, and you know, we do know that that some of these seniors will be um, uh, confused about trying these devices, but we want to come at it from their need. For example, if they want mostly more than anything to talk to other family members, we'll first show them how to use a FaceTime or Skype. So it is it's going to be a needs based training session. Next question by Ms. Boram Kim. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really also a refreshing initiative to hear. My questions are um, two, two questions I have. One is maybe a bit, a bit theoretical question. So when you talk about you know, improving social well-being for the senior citizens, how did you, your organization, come up with this idea of bridging digital divide? Was it uh, mainly triggered by the COVID-19 situation or did you conduct an assessment and then it was a gap uh, among other initiatives that can improve social well-being. And the other one is in the partnership strategy, uh, do you have any plan to work with a volunteer involving organizations specifically to make sure that your volunteer training and recruitment retention are uh, on, on track throughout this uh, pilot initiative? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm sorry, the first question was around yeah, how, how did you come up with this uh, bridging digital oh, divide? It was, yeah. it was entirely needs-based. Um, in, in the uh, trem tremendous work that Better Living already does with um, uh, a, a seniors in the community, they identified the fact that a lot of them are not online. And it's like, how can we fix this problem? So uh, it's that problem's already there and we, we had identified it. Uh, and in terms of working with other organizations, um, Better Living is, right now, we, we kind of have the resources and, and uh, the tools to, to really get started on this. We have a um, volunteer base of 730. A number of those people are techies, and we would certainly reach out to colleges, universities, uh, tech programs to, to uh, recruit more volunteers and so on. Thank you. Next question by Ms. Bianca Faudel. 
Thank you very much for the excellent presentation as well. My question was about the digital literacy and the identification of the digital divide. So I believe it was already answered before, but thank, thank you, you for the excellent work. We also found a study uh, just from July of uh, 2020, it's very recent, and uh, it indicated that 71% of Canadians over 65 are already um, digitally literate. There's, that still leaves almost 30%. But of course, they're using it more and more during the pandemic. Next question by Ms. Maitha Al Mansouri. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it was very clear and uh, really a good uh, project and good luck. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Mohsen. Well done, bridging the digital divide team for such a robust approach you put together. My question is around, so when I was going through the proposal, it said that a lot of your clients, marginalized clients you work with uh, are offline or have indicated that they've never been online. What are the key reasons which you will make sure that you eliminate through this project? Because just giving them access might not help if uh, access within access issues exist as well. Um, if I understand your question right, I, I think that, uh, you know, the one-to-one -one training we would provide would be based on what their needs are. So, as I said, if, if they just want to connect with family, we'll make that happen. If they need uh, to uh, have telehealth with uh, online um, consultations with a medical provider or if they just want some activities and, and to join in on some some of our programs at Better Living, we have already been able to pivot to online delivery, you know, whether it's um, a fall prevention uh, class or it's it's just a fun activity. Uh, so the the individuals who um, uh, we would connect with would we would uh, see what it is that they need. Did that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. I just wanted to know, like, why they are not online in the first place. Well, it, it in some cases it may be um, uh, monetary. They just can't afford internet access, and we are going to address that with uh, initial subsidies for several months and and negotiate a very low cost package for them. And also the thought of uh, in a high density building having a, an internet hotspot available that would service that building. Uh, and we would we would make that happen. Can so, I jump in, uh, Linda? Um, oh, thank you, Hamida. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, if if I understood well, um, we all know that older adults are reluctant to go sometimes to go toward these devices, and they are confused. So part of the ambitions of uh, or objective of this program is to make them feel comfortable with the device and use it. And, and probably to answer your question, many of the older adults, they don't use the system because they are simply afraid of that. And they think they break it or they, are, they feel um, not safe using them. So uh, the volunteers will help to alleviate uh, those fears. Thank you so much, Better Living Healthy and Community Service, Living Health and Community Services from Canada. That was amazing. Um, and uh, we're gonna move now to our next group, which is Draso from Colombia. Um, you may now begin your five minute presentation. Um, Canada, please uh, switch off. Thank you. Now, Draso, you may begin now your five minutes. Meli, el micrófono. Okay, everybody can listen? Yes. Yes, we hear you guys. Did you know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the local government in Cartagena took an average of two months to provide humanitarian assistance in the island area? And in fact, that it had not yet reached other areas. Can you believe it? This has to change. And that is why today we want to talk to you about CEO, caring for each other. 
an interdisciplinary network of volunteers, which will implement a mobile emergency platform, providing timely information and effective communication for the strategic direction of the crisis, creating a center that will provide emergency information, electricity, clean water, internet access, and access to basic services for communities whose basic needs have been historically ignored by the government. In Cartagena, there is an insular area made up of more than 40 islands. One of them is called Tierra Bomba, an island with 6,572 inhabitants, most of them Afro-descendant. The medical infrastructure is inadequate and not existent in some areas. Due to the effects of the climate change, this territory suffers from coastal erosion and constant damage by tropical storms. The source of income for families on the island is mostly informal tourism. The highest level of schooling is secondary and has only one school. Tierra Bomba doesn't have services such as drinking water, natural gas, and they lack a sufficient stable electricity supply. Maria is a resident of, of Tierra Bomba and works selling traditional handicrafts to tourists on the beaches of Cartagena. She has three children and supports her parents financially. During the day of confinement until today, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, she has not been able to work. So for that reason, her family doesn't have food. That's the reality. Maria is struggling with her children who have been psychologically affected. Furthermore, her home has been affected by the ravage of the winter wave that is hiding Central America, Central America at this time. Maria is a classic example of the type of person we are trying to help. Through histories like Maria's, CEO Caring for Each Other was born as an emergency mobile platform that is made up of a power plant, a water desalination plant, satellite internet, radio, table and offline software for the collection of reliable data in real time, especially during time of crisis. During an emergency, CEO activates the interdisciplinary volunteers network at the strategic level and they define the action plan, immediately activating the volunteers at the tactical level who take the platform to the community in order to provide basic services that facilitate the arrival of alias and other aid. Finally, the volunteer caretakers are responsible for the dissemination of the information in the affected population, as well as their care and emotional attention. Finally, CEO, we will, finally, with CEO, we will achieve, provide immediate physical and emotional support to the community impact by the crisis, empower the community to deal with future crisis, collect and make available detailed information in real time, in real time on the crisis for strategic decision making, be a link to achieve the entry of other aid and allies have effective and not update communication for stakeholders in the field, and continue promoting volunteer as a force that moves Mesa's to generate social transformations by working collectively. We are ready to start with CEO. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, team. Now we will move quickly to the judges' questions. First up, Mr. Aziz al -Hamili. go ahead. Thank you, CEO team, and good luck. The question I have here is, what would CEO do as the first thing if it wins or gets the grant? What would be the first thing that you think it's a must do? Thank you. Okay, thanks for your question. The, the first step or the first thing what we want to do if we won, if, if we win this, uh, this IDGEN, um, first of all, we, we are going to 
um, call the volunteers to create the first level of the network, that is the strategic level. Um, then we are going to go to them, to the community, to talk with the um, community leaders that conforms the uh, caretaker levels, that is the one level in the platforms. And not least, but it's very important for us, Trazo is, is a real network of people and business. So the first thing that we are going to do to be, um, or to convocate or to, to, to invite people to be part of this, um, to this idea is um, talk about what we are doing and invite people, invite business, invite um, the education sector to be part of this. That's what, we're going, that's what we are going to do in the first step. Thank you, Melissa. Next up, Mr. Abdullah Shahi. Thank you, Trasa, for the presentation. Well done on that. My question is related uh, to the main function of the group, which is providing materials and support during emergencies. So how you will be able to uh, strike those partnership and uh, secure this, those resources for your, for your activity? Where will be your source of income as well to uh, secure all these resources? Okay, thank you for that question. As I mentioned before, Trasso is a natural network of people and companies which, which allow us to mobilize resources in a collective manner. On the other hand, um, the interest of business alliances in the city to implement their risk management plan, making an attractive project by articulating um, with risk prevention and reduction measures in a vulnerable community in its area of influence. We have two examples of this type, like of this type of, of, of idea. Um, months before we worked on an idea called Entre Todos Nos Protegemos in Spanish. And that was a marathon where we raised around $300 in two months by people, companies, education sector, health sector. And another example of the way we can assure or, or, or get the, the um, be sure to get the resources is the, uh, another example is 48 hour donaton, but led by the government of Bolivar and the mayor office with us, with Trasso, we all, uh, was a marathon in 48 hours in which we, ra we raised um, three, three million of dollars in 88 hours, where um, a contribution mm -hmm. for 77 companies and entities and 1,000 individual people. So we think we have the, we have a real team in, a, in whole the city because we are a social network in, in Cartagena. So we work with government, we work with business, we work with educational se sector, we work with health sector. And that's why we can respond to this type of project in, in whole the world. Sorry to interrupt. In, in, in the city. Sorry to interrupt, Melissa, but we have to move to the next question because we're running out of time. Uh, next question from Ms. Boram Kim. Thank you very much, uh, CEO Tim. That was really interesting to hear. In reference to your, maybe the very first slide showing it took government for two months to deliver um, aid in an affected area, um, affected area. Uh, how, how would you say um, your comparative advantage or the difference to complement the government efforts? My question is coming from uh, usually in, uh, in times of crisis, uh, it's a state responsibility to provide aid to those need and affected and et cetera, in collaboration and partnerships with other stakeholders in a society in general. I wouldn't say it's solely the government responsibility. But here, how, do you, how does your initiative will play a complementary role, uh, not replacing or substitu substituting what government has to deliver? 
That's very important because we are not replacing the, the government. What we are doing is work first, first of all, or fair or, or um, um, care the people's life. And an example of that is the, the um, Entre Todos Nos Protegemos strategy that we, that we did uh, two months ago. Governments was very late to to go to that to the to the islands uh, to the island in Cartagena. They took like six months. We start the COVID nineteen pandemic at twenty March, and the twenty eighth March we we were we were doing the first. Um, the first, um, let, let me remind, how can I say that word, please? We can um, send the other people the humanitarian assistance. Just take for us one week to prepare all the logistics, to, to raise the resources, and to get the opportunity to send the the human uh, the human human uh, to assist them to the people in in that vulnerable society thank you melissa next question from miss bianca fadel and please uh, can you uh, can can you make the answers uh, quick and short because we are almost out of time we have less than two minutes to go Thank you very much for the excellent presentation again. And my question uh, is about um, your SWOT analysis that uh, I really appreciated from the presentation you shared it, uh, with us beforehand. Uh, you mentioned on the analysis two weaknesses that I think are, are key in this project uh, to be overcoming this project, with, which are insufficient connectivity and the mistrust of native populations. So how are you planning to overcome that? Could you talk us a bit through that, please? Thank you. Okay, what we are, what we are going to, that's why the platform have an, um, an offline software with table, it, because we know the real situation in the, in our, in our insular areas is that they don't have um, internet or they don't have, um, they don't have an, they lack a sufficient stable, a stable electricity supply. So what we want to guarantee with this platform is bring the communities all the elements or all the, um, the issues that they need to be connected with the, with the city uh, through, the, through, the, um, through the, the offline software that caretakers volunteered were being um, was being um, taking the information in the community that is having the the, the, the the crisis in that time. I know if that responds uh, your questions. Thank you, Melissa. Next question from Ms. Metha. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and to change the people mind or the city mind, it's take long time, like year and year and year. Based on your platform, what exactly uh, the program or how is your, your idea to change that from your platform? Instead of a platform, our B idea is being an interdisciplinary and multi-level network in order to have volunteers with experience from different, from uh, from our areas that could be affected in a crisis such as health, education, companies, and media. By having these volunteers on the strategic, tactical, and operational front, we, we can minimize the risks in the development of the action plan to face emergency. All levels are very important, but the key in CEO um, are the caretakers because the greatest because the greatest impact is reflected in the content of the crisis. So they must be emphatic. They must be in an advanced development of active listening, mm -hmm. diagnose uh, the communication and decision making capacity, high reaction capacity. That's why 
our platform, we think it's different because we are working with um, with community with, with community with leaders. They are our first level in all this platform because they are they are suffering the crisis in that moment. So if we can bring them the 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 elements to to um, To go out of the crisis is better for, for the for the government, for us, for the NGOs, and for the companies. Thank you again. Last question by Mr. Mohsen before, before we uh, wrap up the uh, session. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'll try and keep it short. So my quick question is around uh, how are you going to expand on your network through the United Way uh, to make sure that your idea is more sustainable? Can you repeat your question, please? So how are you going to use your network of United Fund or United Way? Okay, what, how we, we are going to use United Way funds? That's your question? Yeah. So we, we are part of United Way. Um, we, are, um, uni we are a United, a, a local United Way in Cartagena, but we are Colombia United Way represented. So we have the, um, the network called Fondo Unido, that is United, uh, that, that is Live United in English. So the way we are going to spend the funds is um, maybe doing a crowdfunding with this network that we already have and showing people that can, um, can um, help and can other can help other people with 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 um, um I'm sorry with um bring other people help with hit with their own resources. Okay, I think we need to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, team. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. It was good to have you here with us. Um, okay. Before we conclude this session, uh, Team Traso, can you turn off, please, your uh, presentation? Stop sharing screen. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to ask everyone here in the session to turn on their videos and smile so we can take a quick snapshot before we go to the judging session. Come on, everyone. It was good seeing your faces, and having you all, and seeing your presentations. Good to see you all. Okay, everyone, smile. Wow, beautiful faces. Keep smiling, everyone. Okay, thank you all so, so much. This session uh, was amazing. Um, with the conclusion of this session, I'd like to thank everyone, the participants for your commendable efforts and for your commitment and commitment in supporting the global community with these vital volunteering efforts and uh, to bringing their your determination to the foreground uh, through participating in this idea fun um, the live streaming now will come to a stop uh, our judges will join us in a private session to finalize the judging results uh, to select the winning idea for each sub theme the winning team will be eligible for a performance-based grant of total uh, 25,000 US dollars that will allow the implementation of their idea in the community. If you guys are interested to know who won this, please join us again at 8 p.m. UAE time uh, on the link uh, on, the on the website, which is www.volunteers.ae slash ideathon. 
we'll be happy to see you there to announce the winners. And I would like to ask our judges to kindly join us, join us on the private link uh, that was provided to them to um, announce the winner or select the winner. Good luck, everyone. Uh, this was amazing. See you all soon. Bye-bye.